In this screencast, I want to review some of the basic facts and definitions about graphs that you'll need in a design of an, an analysis of algorithms course. So let's get started. A graph consists of two sets, a set of vertices V and a set of edges usually denoted E. Each edge has either one or two vertices associated with it called endpoints. So it, as you see here, there's a, here's an edge from A to B. Uh, if the edge only has one vertex associated with it, with it then you get what's called a loop. Uh, most of the uh, graphs that we talk about are not going to have loops, loops, so you can pretty much ignore that for now. Um, one thing about graphs that can be a little confusing when you're first learning about them is that the pictures really don't, uh, can be misleading. What matters really is only what the edges connect, not the geometry of the picture. So, for example, in this picture, these edges cross. That doesn't really mean anything. Um, that's irrelevant. You could draw the picture where the edge from, a to, from between A and C goes around. So you have to be careful whenever you're trying to draw conclusions from looking at the pictures. But they are very helpful in lots of cases in terms of developing your intuition. Just remember that the geometry of the picture might not reflect what's actually going on in the graph. Most of the graphs that we'll talk about will be simple graphs. That is, uh, each edge connects two different vertices. You won't get another edge, say, from B to C besides this edge, um, and you won't get loops. There are two basic types of graphs that we're going to be dealing with, um, directed graphs and undirected graphs. Undirected graphs are actually the easiest to usually work with. Um, there's no direct direction associated with the edges. Thus, you can talk about this particular edge as being an edge from V1 to V2, or from going from V2 to V1. It's, or really the way to say it is it's just an edge between V1 and V2. The second kind of graphs are where the edges have direction, in which case the pair of vertices is considered to be ordered. It's an ordered pair of vertices. And you talk about the edge from, say, V1 to V2. So here's just some basic terminology. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this someplace before. An edge is called dis incident to the two vertices that make up its endpoints, and E is said to connect U and V. Uh, two vertices with an edge between them are called adjacent or neighbors to each other. The degree of a vertex in an undirected graph is the number of edges incident to it, uh, except if you have loops, then it contributes uh, two to the degree of that vertex. We're not going to worry too much, actually, about the degree of a vertex um, in undirected graphs. We'll be more concerned with in directed graphs where you have the distinction between in degrees and out degrees. So in a directed graph, uh, the in degree of a vertex is the number of edges where V is the end vertex. In other words, it's the number of vertices coming in to V, hence the name in degree. And the out degree is the number of edges for which V is the start vertex. It's the number of edges that are going out from V. In order to use graphs effectively and solve problems with them, we're going to have to represent them inside the computer. There are a couple of different ways to do that, um, but any way to represent the graphs in the computer, we're going to need a couple of things. We're going to need something to represent a list of the vertices, and someplace we're going to have to have a list of the edges. And those lists will have to be set up in such a way that there's a linkage between the vertices and the edges. But we'll see that in some specific examples. The point here is that we're going to be concerned with the size of the problem. And this, what that's going to, for many of the problems we're going to be working with when we try to analyze their performance. So in the case of a graph, if we're working with the graph, the size is going to be some function of the number of vertices and some number of the function of the number of edges. Um, so, and in most books and papers, and we will do the same thing here, the number of vertices that's represented that way will be denoted, to, or the cardinality of the number of vertices is represented by n, and the cardinality of the edges is represented by m. Um, in most of the graph algorithms, their performance or the computational complexity is going to depend either on the number of vertices or the number of edges or in lots of cases, both the number of vertices and the number of edges. So the first representation will 
review is the adjacency list. And um, the idea here is that you basically, it's what it sounds like. For each vertex, you're going to put the adjacent vertices on some list and associate it with that vertex. Um, now, one thing that may not be obvious right away is that, in fact, what this means is that every edge is going to appear twice. So, for instance, the edge AB here um, is going to appear here on the list for A and here on the adjacency list for B. In a directed graph, that's no longer true. Now, each edges are only uh, going to be on the list of, say, of the start vertex, and they're going to appear only once. So here, the edge, there's an edge from A to B here, and that's only going to appear once. Um, this is the kind of representation that we will use for an adjacency list for directed graphs, um, but it's not the only one. Sometimes it's more convenient, actually, to rather than have the initial vertex associated with the list, you might have the terminal vertices and have each terminal vertex be associated with list. So in other words, you'd be getting the... Uh, you'd have the terminal vertex, say, first, then you'd have all the edges that go into that vertex be represented in the adjacency list. But we won't be using that form much. We'll be using this form where uh, the initial, we have a list for each of the initial vertices. Another representation for a graph in a computer is to use adjacency matrices. Um, I'm not going to go over the definition. The idea is pretty simple. You have an n by n, where n is the number of vertices matrix, and if there's an edge, say, from vi to vj, you put a 1 in that position, um, in the ith position, and if there's no edge, then you put a 0. So we'll see that on the next slide. So this slide has an example of an adjacency matrix, and as you, if you take a look at the two examples, you'll see that it's pretty simple. Here's a, there's an edge from a to b, and so you think of the vertices labeling the columns A, B, C, D, and the rows A, B, C, D. <clears throat> so this one here goes with that edge. <clears throat> the one in the A, C spot goes with this edge, and the one in the A, D slot goes with this edge. And there's no uh, edge <clears throat> here from B to D, and you can see there's got a zero there. And that's really pretty much all there is to it. If there are no loops, and that's uh, the situation we'll be in almost all the time, um, you'll see that the diagonal entries are zero. Also, in an undirected graph, the other thing to notice is that the matrix will be symmetric. Um, in other words, if there's an edge from A to B, then there's that same edge is represented from B to A. That can be very handy in some applications. Now, notice that the storage requirements are different if you're using an adjacency list representation versus an adjacency matrix representation. And you should think about that. I mean, in the adjacency list representation, the storage requirement is going to look like uh, the number of vertices plus the number of edges, right? Because, well, you have to have a list of the vertices, and you have to, have, for each vertex, you'll have a list of the edges that are associated with it. Whereas in an adjacency matrix, the storage is going to be depend on the number of vertices squared, because that's how big the matrix is. Now, that has lots of repercussions um, in terms of both the trade-off between storage and performance, because there are some times where uh, you can get a lot better performance on one, for one representation rather than the other, but you might not be, for instance, the adjacency matrix sometimes is, uh, can be faster for an application. But the problem is, since it's theta n squared for the storage requirement, um, if you're dealing with something like the Internet, uh, N is going to be huge, and N squared is just going to be uh, unusable in any reasonable size computer that we have today. You should stop for a minute and think about uh, what's down here on the quiz. How long does it take to compute the degree of a vertex in the different representations? So how long does it take to compute the degree of the vertex, say, in the adjacency list representation versus the adjacency matrix representation? paths. I'm, I won't go through the definition here in any detail. Um, it's very intuitive. A path is just really a sequence of edges um, that connect uh, one vertex U, say, to another vertex V, and for it to be a path, obviously, when one edge 
end, the end vertex for one edge has to be the beginning vertex of the next edge. And that's really all there is to it. Um, a path is a cycle or a circuit if it begins and ends at the same vertex and has length greater than zero. Um, a path or a cycle is said to pass through the vertices um, and traverse the edges. And a path or a cycle is simple if it doesn't contain the same edge more than once. Most of the paths we'll be concerned with are simple, uh, but we'll have to keep an eye out in certain applications for how our algorithm uh, makes sure that it keeps the graph simple. This is just a simple example to illustrate paths. Um, this path D E C A is not a is actually not a path. If I go to try to D and then go to E and then go to C, there's no edge. So that's not a path. Um, the path in this last case has length 5, but it's not a simple path because you have the edge A to B and A to B appear more than once. Connectivity is an important concept in graph theory. It gives us global information about the graph, namely which parts of the graph are connected to one another and which means that you can get a path from any place in, one, in a connected piece to any other place in the connected piece. In undirected graphs, it's particularly simple. It's just exactly what I said. It's just what you'd think. An undirected graph is connected if any, for any two vertices in it, there's a path from V to W. Now, in order to talk about the different pieces, we're going to need the concept of a subgraph. So G has a subgraph H with vertices denoted by U and edges denoted by F. It's if H is a graph such that U is contained in V and E is contained in F. Now note, H has to be a graph. That is, the edges in F must connect vertices in U can't take an edge out of E uh, and put it into F that doesn't its corresponding vertices have to also be in U. So now we can talk about connected components. Again, this is just for undirected graphs. Um, a connected component is a subgraph that's not a proper subgraph of any other connected subgraph. Okay, so we want a connected subgraph that's as big as possible. That's all that's saying. Um, and a graph that is not connected, if G itself is not connected, then it has two or more connected components that are disjoint, and G will be their union. So here's an example of a graph H um, that's made up of three different components, H1, H2, and H3. Now this is, a pretty, this is pretty intuitive. Now when we get to directed graphs on the next slide, you'll see that life is a little more complex. So in a directed graph, that's called strongly connected. If there's a path for a pair of vertices A and B, and there's also a path from B to A for any pair of vertices in the graph. So in other words, you can go in either direction. You can always go from A to B or B to A in the graph. Now, in lots of directed graphs, they're not going to be strongly connected. And so we'll have a sort of a fallback position, which can be helpful in certain situations. And that's when a directed graph is weakly connected. And that's if there's a path between every two vertices in the underlying undirected graph. So we just take every edge and replace it by an undirected edge, um, effectively doubling in most situations, doubling the number of edges, because remember every edge um, in an undirected graph really represents two edges, going uh, in the opposite directions. So in this slide, we give you an example of a strongly connected graph. Here it is, G. And one thing you'll notice, um, I've got these edges that allow me to go around in this cycle. Okay? And that clearly says I can go from A to B to D, say A to D, and then I can go from D back to A. So because there's a cycle, I can get from any vertex on the cycle to any other vertex on the cycle. So that's a cycle is always going to be in the same strongly connected component. In this cycle, okay, 
I can also go between any of those vertices and notice it's got two vertices in common with the other cycle. So the whole thing is going to be strongly connected. If I want to go from A to C, I can just go like that, or C back to A, I can just go like that. Okay. But H is not strongly connected. And notice all I did with H was change the directions of a couple of the edges. I changed the edge from A to B to now go from B to B from B to A. And the edge from B to D to now go from D back to B. And what that's done is now I've got a cycle that goes here. Okay, so that's going to be a strongly connected component. But now if I can't if I go I can go from D to A, but I can't go I can't go back. There's no way to go back because there's no edge coming out from A. So since there's no edge coming out from A, I know A has to be all by itself as a strongly connected component, and the same goes for C. So in fact, H has three strongly connected components, these three vertices, and then these two vertices off by themselves. Notice that now if I take the union of those three con strongly connected components, I don't get the entire graph. Um, I don't get these two edges that are going that direction. So now we have to use um, our idea of a subgraph in a pretty meaningful way. Namely, that the subgraphs of a directed graph that are strongly connected, but not contained in any larger strongly connected subgraphs, that is, the, they're the biggest, they're as big as they can be, are called strongly connected components, or strong components. Again, the graph H has three strongly connected components, um, two of which are kind of trivial, just the vertex A and then the vertex E, and then finally the subgraph that consists of the vertex B, C, and D, and the corresponding edges between them. Finally, I want to remind you of some important facts about trees. Um, an undirected graph is a tree if there's a unique, simple path between any pair of vertices. So just imagine a tree um, that you've worked with and you realize that if there's a root in the tree, there's a very simple path between that root and any other vertex. You just go down the tree and for anything, any pair of vertices along that path, um, there'll be that subpath that takes that connects those two. Now, sometimes we want to know um, whether a graph is a tree. And the easiest ways to do that sometimes is to check some additional properties and see if it has those. So it turns out that you can check, there are three properties you could possibly check. Is it connected? Is it, are the number of edges equal to the number of vertices minus one? Or is it acyclic? Namely, there are no circuits in it. And it turns out if any two of those are true, then you know you have a tree. And so that's what this theorem says. Take two out of those three conditions. If two of them are true, then you have a tree, and the third condition will also be true. Finally, a spanning tree, which we're going to use a lot, a spanning tree for a connected graph is a subgraph of G that is a tree that contains all the vertices of G. Thus, we know that a spanning tree is connected. It has the number of edges has to equal to the number of vertices minus one, and it's acyclic. So that's it. I know that was a really quick trip, but I'm through graphs. But I'm assuming that uh, you've all seen graphs a couple of times before in your data structures course and your um, discrete math courses, discrete structures courses. And so hopefully this is just a quick review that will get you going um, off to a good start in your algorithms course.